All right, we're live. Um, welcome, everyone. Happy October, which I'm clearly celebrating based on my very intense turtleneck. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for registering and joining. We're really excited for this conversation. Super excited to be joined by Christina today, which I'll give her a few minutes to, to do her, her intro and um, sort of share her background and what she does at Hearst, which... Um, we're really lucky to have her, you know, her expertise and especially someone from such an awesome, interesting brand. So a lot of cool stuff to share. Um, we'll wait maybe like 20-ish seconds for some more people to trickle in. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I just, I guess I'll just call out a couple of things while people are joining. Um, so one thing I'll just preface before Christina goes into her role she brings a ton of expertise in, in specifically the type of role that is more critical now than ever, which is acquisition and growth marketing. So that's going to be sort of a big focus today in this conversation. Um, I think customer acquisition has become sort of the Wild West in the last couple of years, you know, with like cookie deprecation and other like tectonic movement of different privacy regulations. So I know this is at the top of mind for a lot of people, especially tons of the, you know, roles that I saw of those who have registered today. Um, and a major, major part of this conversation is investing in first party data and bringing it together and activating it. And so, um, you know, working with Christina for a while now, she's been an awesome partner at Action IQ and she's got a lot of expertise there and a lot of insights to share. So um, we're really lucky to have her. Um, and thank you, Christina, for letting us pick your brain today. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I guess let's just jump in to, to some quick intros and hopefully everybody can see the screen. Um, if not, drop something in the in the question box and and then I will know. But um, just really quickly before I hand it off to Christina, um, my name is Ariane Seji. I'm a senior product marketing manager here at Action IQ. Um, I work super often with, with customers like Christina to understand how they're leveraging the Action IQ platform to support their marketing strategy, their data strategy, um, and, and how they're actually generating value from the platform. So uh, I've been working with Christina for a while now, and she's been a really, really key part of our partnership all the way back to you know when Hearst was first evaluating C CDP. So she's got a lot of great insights to share. Um, love the opportunity to platform awesome, awesome partners like her. Um, so really take advantage, ask great questions. We, there's a like a Q&A box. Nobody else will see your question, so feel free to fire off in there, and we'll we'll take the time to um, to answer them. But um, let me pass it over to Christina. I've talked definitely enough at this point. So, um, Christina, if you want to go ahead and share just a bit about your role and some context on the areas you're responsible for at Hearst. Yeah, I would love to. Thanks for having me, Ariane. I'm excited to be here today. Yeah. Uh, so I am VP of Growth Marketing and Email at Hearst, and I lead a team here across subscriptions, e-commerce, and sales, as well as traffic driving initiatives. My goal encompasses all email marketing initiatives, so from the strategic planning all the way through to execution in support of revenue diversification. I've been in my role here a really strong advocate for leveraging marketing technology to drive more personalized consumer experiences. Another part of my role here that I uh, love, more of a side passion project, is I'm also involved in Hearst Labs, which is an investment division that provides cash flow to early stage women-led startups. So in this role, I help advise around consumer strategy and marketing. Uh, and so I am a big believer in an advocate for data, tech, and um everything that MarTech can offer in terms of driving and accelerating our marketing. And I'm happy to be talking about that more with you guys today. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, and I know before I even I jump into sort of like the main focuses of today, I know we've got a, a, a solid portion of the group who are joining, um, who are coming from media and publishing, which makes sense um, since Hearst is all things media and publishing. But we also have some folks from brands who are managing like a portfolio of numerous brands, which is also a big sort of motif of our conversation today. So um, trying to understand how to leverage data and tooling and marketing tactics in tandem to kind of create that more holistic journey across different brands. So, um, so yeah, I know this will be super relevant for those two, even if they're not in media. Um, but okay, just a quick roadmap of what we'll discuss. Um, 
this will be very conversational, very sort of like Q&A focused. So again, we can sort of take questions on the fly that come in from, from you all uh, as is relevant. But first, um, we'll talk through just Hearst as a business for those who aren't as familiar. Um, and Christina will give sort of an, an overview of like a typical Hearst customer journey, what that funnel looks like, and maybe some of the main strategic pillars of focus and sort of where they're, where they're uh, prioritizing what the opportunities are. Um, and then we'll sort of double click into some of the more tactical initiatives being deployed to, to drive those pillars forward. Um, a big part of that obviously is data agility. That's like a big thing that we at Action IQ are always talking about and our customers usually are talking about. Um, and then finally, we'll talk a little bit about some learnings and best practices. Again, Christina has like a ton of, you know, insights to share as far as what's worked, what maybe hasn't worked and how that testing and iterating um, has gone. So that's just sort of a, a quick overview. So let's just jump in. Um, I'll hand it back to Christina. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about Hearst as a business, how things are structured um, and sort of like the different brands, different product offerings and, and some of the nuances there. Yeah, so Hearst is over 100 years old. Uh, it's a global company whose businesses actually span financial services, health services, transportation, television networks, stations, newspapers, and magazines. Uh, the magazine division, as I mentioned before, is where I work. And so we operate globally across a diverse portfolio that spans lifestyle, enthusiasts, wellness, fashion, luxury, and automotive verticals. We publish some of the most iconic brands that you may have heard of, including Esquire, Good Housekeeping, Harper's Bazaar, Cosmo, and House Beautiful. And we are a media company that is continuing to evolve to meet the changing needs of our audiences, leveraging technology and consumer insights to deliver impactful and engaging experiences. Over the past year or two, I'd say our offerings have become much more robust. Um, we really transitioned from being like a legacy print publishing company to offering more premium subscriptions, digital subscriptions, as well as more commerce opportunities beyond just affiliates. So that includes direct products on certain brands, as well as more newly launched marketplaces. And given the sheer breadth of our portfolio, so I work across 20 plus brands and the multiple business lines that we now have to scale, it's super important to us to be able to figure out how we can be more agile. And so technology and leveraging data has been a big accelerator there in our ability to evolve and uh, keep up at the fast pace that we need to. Yeah, that's um, that's so interesting. And I always forget, I always forget about transportation and financial services that actually, that's so fascinating how many industries Hearst is touching, but um, and we've talked about this a lot, and I'm sure this is, you know, relevant for a lot of the folks who are listening. But you know, with expansion and with scale, and as you're starting to, um, you know, build out different verticals and different product offerings, that obviously um, that poses the risk of just more data silos. And so, and this is something that Christina, you've talked about a lot as we've been preparing for this, but like continuing to evolve and iterate. Um, you're never staying stagnant with your strategy, whether it's your marketing strategy or your data strategy, uh, but especially if you're starting to expand to different verticals that creates a ton of complexity on the data side and just continuing to have that central understanding of the subscriber. So um, I guess a next, a next thing we can maybe touch on um, and transition to from here is what are, you know, with all of that in mind, some of like the main pillars of focus or sort of like the foundations um, that you and your team think about in order to drive some of these opportunities? Yeah, one thing I just want to touch on um, with what you had said just around like the evolution and agility is somebody I heard say recently, I was like, okay, what's your playbook? And it's interesting because a playbook infers that you are remaining static and nobody wants to be static anymore. So yeah. a lot of the theme I think of today will be around this idea of like, keep moving, evolving, adaptability, agility. Um, but this is kind of bringing it back to basics. And so while scales become super important to us, we've also been leaning more into these brand specific strategies where we're striving to meet the consumer where they are. And in order to do that effectively, you really need to understand where your consumers are falling in terms of their journeys. So are they in the awareness stage or the consideration, conversion, retention, loyalty? So basic journey mapping. Uh, and the idea is to 
tie your audience segmentation to that. So you're actually looking at and treating your customers based on where they are at in their journey, because not all customers should be treated the same. In fact, I feel like today more than ever with the evolving privacy regulations and so forth, it's super, super important and expected from the consumer to have a more personalized, tailored point of view um, with the brands that they're, they're reaching out and engaging with them. So for instance, a customer that is new to our brand, so maybe they've just signed up to a newsletter, is likely going to take more time to convert to a paid subscriber than somebody that's further down the funnel. And so if we focus with that example on strengthening their engagement with the brand and then over time demonstrate value, right, and more brand loyalty potentially as much as possible in becoming a paid subscriber or wanting to make that brand more part of their daily lifestyle or whatever, then this individual is more likely to convert. And so we see higher conversion rates on our side when we start to treat people differently based on where they're at in terms of their customer journey. I think that's super important for ROI um, because in the long run, once somebody is a paid subscriber, they're going to drive more repeat sessions to our website. So increased traffic, more likely to purchase other either commerce or direct products from us. So uh, your bottom of the funnel is going to be some of your most loyal and, and high value customers. And so trying to move as much as we can down the funnel is really important. But a strong segmentation strategy is required to do that. You have to know your audience. You have to understand their motivators, what's going to resonate with them and the action you ultimately want to drive. And so audience segmentation has been the foundation of our omni-channel marketing strategy and a big reason as to why we ended up moving forward with the CDP. Yeah, that's super helpful. I know like when we talk about or when we do these webinars, I think it's it's always helpful to just first talk about what a typical customer or what a typical customer journey framework looks like because it is very different from brand to brand, especially for those here who aren't in you know the media or subscription space. Um, but I think another thing that I want to ask is like a follow up is you mentioned um, converting from trial trialist to paid subscriber is like a, a a very critical touch point. Um, what are some of the other, you know, specific critical areas of opportunity that you are focused on? Um, maybe that's even like uh, anonymous to known, because I know that's um, like a really tricky um, area uh, as a as a media company. Just understanding who your unknown readers are, so that you can offer that tailoring and that personalization that you mentioned? Um, what are maybe like one or two sort of key areas that you're really thinking about? Yeah, well, the the increasing the scale and the top of funnel is super important and anonymous for us has been a big part of that, right? In terms of just there's an enormous amount of volume of unknown traffic that we mm -hmm. want to try to convert to known and eventually build up that relationship with us so that they, they move further down. Um, I think similar to that example that I gave with the newsletter uh, sign up, it's been very much a nurturing from that perspective. And so leveraging Action IQ, we have been able to do anonymous targeting through Meta to try to get those people to give us an email. We have found that when we try to get them to sign up or buy something immediately, it doesn't resonate as well. So again, it's like really earning that relationship, showing yeah. up in their inbox with content and value and getting them to look and resonate with your brand as an authority as possible. And so we've been doing a lot of experimentation on how to engage those people differently, obviously, than somebody that's got more um, brand loyalty to us or is further down. Um, the other thing I would say, too, that's been super important is also not just like focusing on increasing top of funnel, but the re-engagement of people who are falling off, be it an email or if you're in a subscription type of model, uh, former subscribers. So that could look differently. But I think that's important and true for all brands, whether you're a media company or not. Getting those people back, earning those people back. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about a lot is like preference management tied because so much of the first party data is tied to an email, right? So giving more flexibility around what people want and are expecting. Maybe they don't want to get an email from your brand every day, but they might want to get, you know, in right moments or, you know, twice a week might be a better cadence for them. And so trying to not only re-engage former audiences and win them back, but also try to allow more personalization around like the preferences of, of what they're getting. 
Yeah, that's a good point because um, I, I've talked with other customers about, you know, this notion of over communication, which is obviously, I don't think anyone is a stranger to that. I think we've all had that happen where um, you're sort of inundated with communications and while they may be personalized and while some of the content might be resonating with them, it's, it, it, there, there's a there's a fine line and there's like a there's a balance to strike there with the timing, the content, the channel, all of those things. So um, that's a really good point. And I know um, there's a whole realm of sort of this strategy um, as it relates to you know cross sell, which like getting somebody who's reading one brand to hop over to another brand. And maybe that's something you'll touch on later. So I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I, I did also want to mention that because I feel like that's especially challenging beyond all of the other challenges you just mentioned. Yeah. So the cross sell we used to do a lot of traditionally, uh, we definitely, and I, I just in general, it was ingrained in like just the marketing approach, just again, because of the sheer breadth of what we have. Yeah. But I think what we've found is as communications have increased, right, and, and information is more accessible, finding the right moments of where it makes sense and ensuring that there's, even though they're obviously all under the Hearst umbrella, that there's really strong brand alignment. That's been super, super important because you could over cross sell, particularly in an email space. You might find mm -hmm. me during this conversation very much gravitating towards email because that's often the channel that's used. Um, but making sure that it is going to add value to the consumer or be something that they want. Don't just do it for sheer volume and, and breadth and reach. You want to make sure that you're also looking at uh, definitely you want those opportunities because it's going to be more cost effective than trying to you know, go out and acquire potentially the same customer who you might already have established with another brand relationship, but ensuring that the data, whether it be engagement or conversion data is showing that this is actually adding value to that consumer. And so there's more uh, trade-offs I would say that we're making in terms of like making those assessments on, yeah. is this the right opportunity to be cross-selling when there is, uh, especially within specific verticals too. Yeah, that makes sense because I guess there there can be a risk of cannibalizing, um, you know, the the engagement with other brands, but then also your your marketing budget. But I like what you said about your I guess thinking about just preserving a high quality experience for the customer, which I think everyone is really shooting for. So, yeah, and I would just say too, context is super important, right? Like if you're yeah. going to reach out and promote a certain offer, like there needs to be that connection that's easy for the consumer to make, whether it be in your marketing collateral or copy, et cetera. That's like, this is why you're getting it. This is why we think it would be helpful for you. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, awesome. So I guess we've now we've given everyone the lay of the land in, in terms of um, <laughs> water in my throat, in terms of the, the Hearst customer journey. I think this was like a really good preface. Um, do you want to maybe talk about some of the sort of, fundamentals, let's bring it back to sort of the strategy of how you're driving a lot of the, the, the goals that you just mentioned. Yeah. So adaptability, agility, I feel like the buzzwords words of the day. Mm -hmm. um, Always. The adaptable data strategy is super, super important. The rate of change that we've been seeing feels like it's unprecedented and accelerating just when I feel like it can't happen any faster, it does. Uh, and so our approach to creative and content offers needs to keep up. And I don't think that data should be any different. Uh, you want to avoid being handicapped by your data so you don't have to continuously reevaluate your framework as part of your marketing evolution. And so I think looking at what data you're using, uh, what data you're not using, what data is not helpful anymore, and, and really having a holistic view is how that data aligns with where you want your marketing trajectory and, and growth plans to go is important. I think the stack optimization also comes into play. Just like you don't want to be limited by your data, you shouldn't be entirely dependent on like just one tech partner. There's so many mark tech solutions out there. And so I think it's important to like continue to evaluate partners and opportunities and, and what's out there, what you could be leveraging, um, different ways of doing things. And they all have lots of case studies and et cetera that I think could, could provoke new thoughts and innovation. So I also think in that uh, realm, looking for integrations to augment your efforts and drive performance and scale, as well as reduce costs and mitigate risk is super important too. And then 
around the customer journey and the segmentation, you know, our approach has been very much looking for new opportunities to identify if you have the right audience. I think that's super important that offers change, consumer demands change, and you need to need you may need to change your view on your audiences as well. Um, we've looked at as like email sources, for instance, have changed and we saw like an acceleration in like Google one tap signups, like potentially we need to have a different path for how we treat or look at data than we've had before just because of the scale and the opportunity it presents. So I think that that's a, a really important thing. And similarly, if you start to notice that certain audience segments are shrimp, shrinking or could be collapsed, I think that becomes another opportunity to, again, like reevaluate if that approach that you had implemented is still the one that you want to have for the future. So you're not continuing to build and build and build without addressing some of the legacy structure that you had. So it's been, I think, a constant evolution around how to navigate uh, the changing environments for the business. Obviously for us, you know, it's also from the lens of like the brand perspective because we have so many brands that we represent too in terms of what their goals are because they're not all created equal. Um, and just really trying to make sure that we had the right framework to be as adaptable as possible, but also be forward thinkers in terms of just setting up the infrastructure that we think we're going to need to uh, align with our, our goals. Yeah. And I'm glad you said that because that's actually a perfect segue to my next question, which I want to kind of like unpack the, the stack optimization a little bit more because uh, I think what you said about addressing uh, legacy infrastructure is something that will resonate with a ton of people who have joined. And this is just like a big hot topic of conversation right now for those who are now sort of um, dealing with the harsh realities of what they've been putting out for a long time as far as like sort of trying to rebuild or redesign their stack for for the future, not just for now, um, but for 5, 10, 15 years into the future. So um, I guess a couple of questions, which maybe you can answer in independently or in tandem. Um, at what point did you or, you know, Hearst recognize the need for a CDP? Like what sort of led you down that road, which you kind of touched on a little bit on, in the last slide. Um, but then how did you approach finding the right CDP um, to sort of align with what you said about, you know, um, being more future proof, um, being more um, first party focused, um, like building for the future, essentially, and, and aligning to that future vision from a tech standpoint. Yeah. So we ended up beginning to explore the need for a CDP, I guess it was about three years ago. And I approached it very much from a marketing perspective mm -hmm. because we had an increasing amount of obviously brands, but also then more product offerings. So we had started pivoting into these different membership tiers. And so we were having challenges with basic things like unlocking the the Wimback Rider right, former subscriber segment that should be like marketing 101 and intuitive and part of our thing. And so a lot of that was dependent on this legacy like database structure and some fragmentation that we had. We actually had a lot of data fragmentation. And so trying to figure out the right approach and tools that we could potentially use, whether it was like an ESP thing or does it become a different like CRM type of tool and ultimately landed on we have too much data fragmentation too many data silos even where i want to go from a marketing perspective we're not going to be able to get there if we don't address the data challenges that we have mm -hmm. and so that was very much the crux of it i'd say it was augmented though because it was around the time um just before mpp so the apple mail privacy changes went into place and early conversations <laughs> around the Google cookle deprecation um so I recognize that there was a need for us to be growing our first party data and, and increasing our dependency around like harnessing our first party data, getting more in, being able to, again, do more off of that. And so the first party data strategy was very much also ingrained in one of the reasons why we ended up moving forward with a CDP. In terms of the process, uh, it was interesting because there's there's so many out there, right? If anything, it's probably gotten more complicated because like there's not just like CDPs anymore. There's different like ESPs doing things like in more of like the CRM space and then journey management tools. And it just feels very messy yeah. and confusing. And so I at least knew that I 
didn't have an ESP issue, or at some point I did pretty early on, and that it was a CDP issue. So at least was able to focus in on that framework and reached out to a lot of different prospective um, CDP partners. I ended up approaching it as to trying to find people that I thought either through like internal recommendations or um, we're going to bring different things to the table. One of our biggest challenges at the time when we were scoping out was also just, again, the volume of brands. We needed a CDP that was going to be able to support the infrastructure of having like more than just a handful of brands because we had like the 20 plus. So that actually helped enormously in terms of identifying what we thought were going to be the best um, potential partners. I also, Action IQ ended up progressing further along too, just from like a client perspective. You worked with publishers, you worked with e-commerce. We wanted somebody that was going to really um, be able to support the different business diversification that we had. And so, um, you know, I, it's funny though, because there were, there are so many options or trajectories you could go. And so what I found most helpful along the process was really nailing down our use cases, which then got more specific once we were getting to like the final rounds in terms of where those netted out to be able to have conversations to be like, this is where we want to go. These are our biggest challenges. How are you going to help us get there? Uh, because at the end of the day, we probably could have gone with a lot, but Action IQ happened to align most with the path and plan of where we were focusing our efforts for. Uh, so it's tough, definitely a lot of conversations and evaluations just along the way to, to, to find the perfect match for us. Yeah, uh, and I think that makes sense. I, I I think, like you mentioned, the the broader like landscape has become so messy, you know, so sort of convoluted. Um, everyone is still trying to figure out um, what they need, what does what, um, and I think ultimately just having those conversations and really seeking that that like level of partnership with are you able to sort of are we able to walk through what we need to do hand in hand over the next one two three five years um because you know in a, in a lot of these conversations you know folks do come to the table come meet us and talk to our teams and at the end of the day what they're looking for isn't what we provide and, and it's it's a constant education and learning experience um you know across martech so um, so yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense and, and that's, that's good insights for anyone here who is sort of starting out that, that process. Um, so I guess this would be a good time. Maybe we can move ahead and, um, talk a little bit about some of like the tactics, um, or the initiatives in motion that are driving some of these fundamentals. Um, maybe some of the use cases. I know we have some people who have joined who are a little bit more of like practitioner level and might be interested to hear some of these initiatives that that you're actually deploying. Um, so you want to talk through some of these? Sure. I know we've talked a bit about already about the anonymous audiences, uh, so I won't go into too much detail there. But being able to identify the anonymous audiences and then retarget them again, even though we're still trying to figure out the right approach in terms of driving the right action and ROI to uh, earn or know who they are and convert them to known unlocking that alone was a big feat for us just because of the sheer volume that we had. So, and obviously in terms of driving scale, the other I would say is just around the lookalike uh, audiences. So we have been able to do audience segmentation off of our like highest value customers and then build lookalikes through paid media, primarily meta, uh, trying to acquire similar people. And so that's been pretty lucrative for us uh, on a lot of our brands. Dynamic suppressions um, has been helpful as well. So, and this may be so basic and, and <laughs> maybe the majority of the people here were already doing this, but this is something that was challenging for us prior to having a CDP. We would have to get monthly pulls of active subscribers to then do like manual suppressions against in our paid media campaigns. And so once we were able to implement the CDP, we were able to do dynamic suppressions so that we ultimately have those subscribers being suppressed immediately from purchase. It's like one of my pet peeves when I'm like on social media platform and <laughs> I get an ad for something that I'm already a subscriber or like for um, probably not as much relevant maybe for e-commerce because you want to target those people, et cetera, but maybe you want to treat them differently. So that's been important too. Uh, content led targeting has been an interesting one for us. And so we're kind of just 
begin scratching the searches for this, but we have tagged our websites, our editorial websites for uh, with Action IQ so that we can attribute um, content behaviors, I guess, against uh, somebody's profile. And so we are experimenting. I would say this is another area where like your data structure is super, super important in terms of like cleanliness, because we had to make some tweaks along the way just because of what it ended up looking like just because of our taxonomy. Um, but we're doing things like on our runner's world, for instance, trying to identify people that are maybe early on in their marathon journey training, uh, or somebody that's in market for uh, a lot of easy weeknight kind of recipes because of their busy schedule and ensure that we're using that to help then ensure messaging matches up. I would caution though, that for us, it's also been balancing that with volume and scale and not all of them have worked. So if you end up with a, a very small list, that's probably not going to be a lucrative opportunity to focus on from a marketing perspective, especially a paid perspective, just because your CPCs are going to be so much higher. Uh, and so we've been trying to figure out like the right balance here and mix in terms of how we experiment with content. But I'm excited by some of the stuff that we're seeing. We're also talking about doing more behavioral led targeting. So if somebody takes a certain action on the site or engages with some sort of video or class, do we then do targeting to those people as well and nurture them through like a journey uh, to help? And again, the messaging is super important in connecting those experiences that you're bringing the audience. Otherwise, it's not really adding value. So those two things need to go together. And then the last is just so even though so much of what we're doing, aside from the anonymous, right, but even that is about targeted audiences, we are seeing opportunities of success, too, in going after broader based audiences and search channels, particularly those that are like Meta has a product that leverages AI. So trying to see if and when we can cast a wider net with the right message, can we, again, help drive scale and top of the funnel to ultimately like feed down to conversion. So there's a ton of audience targeting, testing that's happening. And then in tandem with that, also thinking about personalization. So dynamic product recommendations and content recommendations have been important for us very much on the, the email side of the business, especially now that we have more robust products like commerce offerings. Um, so making sure that, you know, people aren't constantly seeing like a static like e-commerce feed or in some instances, we will have curated picks because the editorial team feels strongly that they've spent time curating this type of content, et cetera, or the moment just qualifies for it. So it's definitely balancing that with personalization. I don't think everything should be personalized. I think it needs to be a blend of like kind of broader custom experiences that have contacts and align with a brand's direction or the moment, but also you want that, that scale and agility and adaptability that the personalization aspect is going to have. Um, to ultimately help improve the consumer experience. We are doing some testing around like pricing and offers. And I hope that that's a, a place that we'll be able to play more from like a personalization and dynamic perspective in the future. And then on the email side, we have found a lot of success leveraging um, email personalization send times. So little things like that and tools and tapping into like the MarTech that you have or you're potentially looking to deploy in the future can have uh, positive impacts on performance for sure. And I think personalization in general is gonna be really, really important for the future, especially as you have more audience segments to be able to create those better experiences, you need to be able to le leveraging personalization in tandem with the audience targeting. Yeah, this is super helpful. And it just goes to show how many moving parts there are. And, and to your point, like when there are this many moving parts, you have, you know, the content, you have like the hyper segmentation, um, you have pricing, you have different products. Um, the, the testing, the way you go about testing is everything. Um, so it was interesting to hear you touch on that a little bit. Um, and the, the dynamic suppressions, you, you could call them basic, but, um, you know, just from our experience doing that or executing that use case with a ton of customers and tons of different industries, um, it, it's, a very sort of like low hanging fruit use case that can be really impactful. Um, so yeah, this was, this was super interesting. I, I'm glad that you went into some specifics um, and just kind of gives more context into how 
um, how precise and how complex, you know, curating these experiences are from, from the back end. So, um, so yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I guess maybe we can, from here, if you want to talk a little bit about some of the impact you've seen, um, or maybe some of the impact you're expecting, um, just kind of like from a high level standpoint. And then from there, maybe we can talk a little bit about sort of like what's next, what you guys are thinking about for, for the next stage. Yeah. So I think from a scale perspective, obviously the anonymous stuff and, and getting more people to know is, is helpful, but at the heart of it, it's really growing your first party data or your known user base and amplifying with information that you think will help improve consumers' experience with your brand and drive action that you want to drive. I think with, again, the privacy regulations and changes, this is becoming more and more important and every brand needs a strong first party data strategy and also an adaptable one. From a creative perspective, uh, creative, just like from an audience being so important, I think the creative and the messaging and the marketing around that is super, super, super important. I know I said this before, but like context, context is everything. Uh, we have seen that stronger dynamic creative, uh, particularly on like higher value brands has a lot of potential to drive ROI and people down the funnel. We've also seen leveraging like real life people and content partner collaborations is helpful as well. But the most important thing of it, similar to what you said before is test, test, test can always be iterating from a creative perspective because creative fatigue happens so quickly now. Um, and so that's something that we're constantly, constantly trying to just like continue to try different approaches, different things, particularly on paid social. Uh, that's probably been the most important there. And then making sure we have frameworks and adaptability, like on the email side to like leverage templates where possible so that there's creative elements that can be tweaked more easily to either align with an audience segment uh, or a potential strategy shift. And then I guess from a marketing perspective, I would just say, you know, treating your audiences the same across channels is ideally something that you want to do. You want to try to unite those experiences with mm -hmm. consistent messaging and leveraging data where possible, at least to your highest value um, audiences. You also don't want to do it in a creepy way. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff out there, even stuff I get that I'm like, oh, this is weird. I visited this yeah. website and now I'm getting emails from them. And I didn't <laughs> like, I think there's a borderline between like the cohesiveness and, and growing that scale, um, but also being respectful of consumers and, and not freaking them out. Um, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, as you're increasing scale, that really drives the need for more audience segmentation, what then requires, uh, better creative, but enables you to have more cohesive marketing, which creates a better consumer experience. Yeah, it's, it's such a, it's such a balance. I have to say, I feel like that's like a motif of, you know, a lot of the things that you mentioned, and it goes back to the testing and um, just really seeing what mix resonates between the timing and the personalization and some of the general, uh, the more generic offers that you mentioned. Um, I think that's a good point. I think it does have to be some healthy mix. Um, so it must be really interesting to see to see the numbers or to see the takeaways from from this testing. But to your point, it's it's never stopping. It's like test, 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 constantly iterating. Um, so I think that's a really good takeaway from from this whole thing. Um, well, this was really, really helpful, really amazing. It was honestly, even though we've been, you know, prepping for this, um, a lot of this was really interesting and fascinating to me because we hadn't gotten to to the details the way we did today. But um, I guess, you know, we can wrap up in the next few minutes. Um, I can, you know, ask a, a couple more questions, just double clicking into some other learnings and takeaways that I feel like might be helpful for this group. Anyone who uh, who's on, feel free to drop in some questions right now. I think now would be a good time and, and we can address any that come in. But um, in the meantime, I guess one thing I will ask, um, you've talked a few times about, you know, data agility and adaptability, um, but especially from the perspective of like not overcomplicating your data strategy. And I feel like once again, um, this is something that can be really challenging for a lot of brands is how do you balance um, that sort of like more simplistic approach to data with the personalization and the tailoring and, and the hyper segmentation 
I know we've talked a little bit about how you can sort of self-sabotage by over-segmenting. So um, do you have any sort of like learnings around that? Yeah, I would. I definitely think at least from the origin and start, you want to make sure you have clean data uh, in consi- a consistent way, especially if you're similar to how we were early on with like the disparate data sources. Because when you try to bring all that together, if it's not cleaned or you haven't accounted for the structure that you want, and data mapping, if it's needed, you're going to end up with a mess. Um, so I think that that is super important. I also think not pulling everything in because that obviously has cost impact. And it has, I think it kind of handicaps in a way too, because you don't want to be drowning and overwhelmed in data and the amount of data. So again, having those use cases is super important. And then figuring out what data you need to enable and support those use cases, and then look at where you want to go and what other data attributes might need in the future. So not just like staying still. I know I mentioned the thing about the playbook before, but I think a lot of people look at um, the CDP potentially as like, okay, you're going to set this up and it's like going to save everything. And somebody said to me once, like, what, like the CDP was going to output like a strategy for you. And it's like, no, the C- you need to make your own strategy. And the CDP is an accelerator to help you get there, hopefully, if that's what you need and your business needs. Um, so I think a lot of planning and uh, around that part is important too. And then I guess the last thing I would just say from uh, the hyper segmentation, and I know we talked about some of the audience sizes, but you can end up with an un- un- unmanageable amount of audiences, like because like it's endless how much you can continue to to split your data if you wanted to and create more segments. And so I think you need to look at it through the lens of not only where you think the most potential is going to be, but what you're going to be able to support for your team from a marketing perspective, a creative perspective, executional perspective, because if you can't align the marketing, it's not likely to be successful. And if you end up creating so much complexity in your framework, it's going to debilitate you from being more agile or capitalizing on opportunities in the future. So that's something that, uh, you know, we're continuing to try to evaluate uh, if in instances where, you know, we've been activating an audience through Meta or like some of the brands where we were doing anonymous and we found it wasn't working, like we turned those off or pivoted from that uh, because it just wasn't going to be cost effective and it was just bringing in too, too much. So like you don't want to bring everything you have. You need to really identify and have purpose with the data you're going to use and the data you think you need. Yeah. And I feel like that's, um, you know, sort of a foundational challenge that a lot of brands are dealing with is how are we toggling the data, the marketing, and the tooling constantly, like you yeah. said. So because well, uh, it's it's never done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I guess I'll see if any more questions come in. Um, last chance for everyone. I am going to ask this one more question to to Christina. So back to sort of like the future proofing of the tech stack. Um, we talked a little bit about this, but you know, composability has been a big, big topic that I think right now it's become buzzy. And just as a result of that, um, a lot of data teams and marketing teams are sort of starting to explore that and see, um, is this something, is this, is it worth us going down this road if we're going to see the value um, long-term, even if it's a long road to get there? So is this something that your, you and your team are thinking about in the future, consolidating your data in the data warehouse, reducing data copy? Um, is this something that's on your radar? Um, and are you working with a with a data warehouse? Yeah, so I mean, that's something that we're constantly like reevaluating, I would say, just in terms of like, as part of like our tech track and structure and knowing the data, uh, what the future looks like, our trajectory, our business needs have changed and will continue to change. And so, yeah, but first party data is very much an important focus for us and, and where we see, at least from a marketing perspective, uh, growth for the future. So that continues to be a process for reevaluation and looking for efficiencies, whether it be in the cost side or the scale or agility side to uh, help us get there faster and drive more revenue in the process. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, well, the sun has come out. Um, well, I think that's, I think that's pretty much it for us. Um, if anyone thinks of questions, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, just so you know, We'll reach out with the recording. I think you'll get the recording um, right after this ends. So if you want to watch back, feel free. If you have any questions, just reply to the email or or reach out to 
um, uh, your customer success manager if you're if you're a, a customer, or um, reply to the the emails that you've been receiving. But thank you all so much for joining. There's a few content pieces that I added. If anyone's interested in exploring them, we have um, Action IQ CDP Market Guide. We have the um, Forrester B two C CDP Wave, um, and then we have a couple other pieces of content from from us um, with some examples of other media customers and multi-brand customers if you're interested in exploring more there. Um, but otherwise, Christina, thank you so much. This was really fun. It was really interesting. Always a pleasure working with you. Mm -hmm. um, and and yeah, thanks again for joining. Thanks for having me. All right. Have a good, day. Have a good one.